Good morning, church. Look at this beautiful day we were blessed with, right? It's going to be sunny. I checked the forecast all day. I'm very excited. Um, welcome to First Baptist Church here in Norristown. Happy Father's Day and happy Juneteenth. Um, quite a big weekend, I know. Um, we have a bunch of folks in, in their Father's Day outfits. I love to see it. Please uh, help us, the praise band up here, praise the Lord today. This first one's called Rest on Us. And this one's going to be led by Pastor C.G. Coates. Will you stand with us? As the Spirit was moving over the water, the Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, the Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. I 
When you speak and when you move and when you do what only you can do, changes us, it changes what we see.
church, we pray with me. Lord, thank you for washing over us with your spirit. Thank you again for this beautiful day that you've given us and for all of your creations around us. Just as you are our father to us, Lord, we are your kin that you, you help pick up and guide after we've been knocked down. Help us bless, bless the fathers down here on your earth today, Lord, that they may keep their patience and ease of expression and be a guiding light for their young. Let us also be with all of those who have lost their fathers, Lord, also those who are not fathers any longer or, or couldn't have been fathers. We are here praying to you, Lord, continue to thirst for your spirit and your endless grace. Let us together say the words that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are here. And happy Father's Day to the fathers that walk this earth and are no longer with us, but is with our Heavenly Father. And please uh, join me with our call to worship today. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb are reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Amen. Uh, please be mindful of the various ways that we can give here at First Baptist Church of Norristown. Uh, offerings and tithing are very important uh, to, the, um, to sustaining our, our purpose here. Uh, please note that you can give uh, by uh, placing an envelope or uh, money in one of the plates outside. And also, something that we started a few weeks ago, if you take a look up front, you'll notice that we have the QR codes on the back of the chairs, which is a very... Um, uh, good electronic method of, of uh, offering as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for you are God and there is no other. You are God and there is none like you. You love us with an eternal love and we give our offerings as an expression of our love for you. We pray our gifts will be used to extend your kingdom in our land. May you, the God of all grace, who has called us into eternal glory by Christ Jesus, Make us holy, strong, and filled with peace. To you be the glory and honor forever and ever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, and we have some connect points.
want to go over a few right now. Uh, World Vision. Today is World Vision monthly offering to support three children who have benefited from your generous giving over the years. Donation envelopes are located by the entrance and exit doors of the sanctuary. Thank you for your continued support of that. And youth group, the next meeting is going to be uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday, June 22nd at 6.30 p.m. And back by popular demand, join us for an afternoon of fun and fellowship with uh, Liz and CG, who's going to be delivering uh, uh, a, a devotional. Uh, it's painting with a biblical twist. It's going to be here Sunday, this, uh, July the 17th, 1 to 3 p.m. Enjoy an afternoon of, uh, of lantern painting led by Liz Steele Coates and a devotional by Pastor CG. Please join. It was uh, a really good time last time, so we're happy that Liz is doing it again. And VBS, Passport to Peace, August 1st to August 5th from 9 a.m. to noon. Volunteers and donations are needed. Really, really needed, right, Gary? They're needed. <laughs> so uh, you can register at the uh, information you see right there. And the next planning meeting for VBS is going to be uh, next Sunday, June 26th. Now, I would like to, oh, here come some other brothers. Oh, are you two related? Look at that. You guys look great. Nice. I like that. So um, I am wearing uh, <laughs> my Father's Day stuff. I got this wonderful shirt. Yep, for my, my daughters and my wife. I got these wonderful pants. And uh, Ruby says that uh, people are going to laugh because they look like pajamas. And I said, Ruby, they are pajamas. <laughs> And I got some really cool gangster, uh, what is it, gold chain underwear that I won't show you, but I am wearing it in honor of Father's Day. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I would like to tell you about something, you guys. I want to tell you about something that I got for me. Are you looking? Here we go. Now, a couple weeks ago, I went and I said, you know what, I need some work gloves. So I went and I got these because they have bright colors and they have the black here that will keep splinters from getting into my fingers. And these are my work gloves. And I came home and I put them down and I looked at them. And they didn't do anything. I was waiting. I said, come on, work, do something. They didn't do anything. Look at that. They just sit there. But I had a really, I have a really cool neighbor uh, at my new place, uh, Mr. Tracy. And he says, no, 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 no. You see, you don't wait for them to work. You have to work with them and in them. And now they can work. Look, they can touch Owen's head. Look at that. Can I snap my fingers? Can't do that yet. I'm still working on that. But it struck me that this is, this is like me. This is like you too. We sit there and we say, oh, you guys looking? We say, Lord, I want you to do something with me. I want you to work in me. I want you to teach me. I want you to help me do the right thing. I want you to help me serve. I want you to help me listen to my parents. Right, Ruby? Yes. And then we sit there and nothing happens. And it's only when the Lord comes into us and we let him fill us up with his Holy Spirit that we can do the work. And we don't only, we don't only do what we pray for. We do whatever work he wants us to do in him or with him. So when you look at these gloves, think about how they don't work if there's nothing in them. When you look at the church, when you look at yourself, think of how you don't really work the right way if the Lord is not in you. If God is not in this place, then we're not really doing anything. So we want the Lord to be with us, right? 
We want him to be in us. So we need to ask him and we need to wait for him. Okay? So with that, please extend your hands to the children. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for these wonderful gifts and these children that you have given us. And again, we come together to give them back to you, that you may be in them and in us to do your good work. Help us, Lord, to be yours. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right, thanks. Let's go. Uh, we come now time to our praises and our prayer requests. Um, we are thankful for our fathers. Praise God for the fathers. Praise God for happy Juneteenth and, ha you know, Emanci Emancipation Day and whatnot. We are thankful for that as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Um, we thank you for the fathers in our lives, the father figures in our lives, the uncles, um, the moms that might have had to step up, Lord, in, in that way. Um, we acknowledge them. We're thankful for the love, the care that they give for us, the protection that they give us, and the courage that they give us each and every day. Lord, we're thankful for this Juneteenth as well as we celebrate um, the freedom of the African Americans in our nation, Lord. We thank you for what we have learned through our history, the causes and the issues that we have, that we've created, and we acknowledge them today. We accept them, and we want to do better each and every day, Lord, to welcome our brothers and sisters uh, around the nation. Lord, there's so many people that are suffering right now. We think of people with COVID. We think of the people of Ukraine. We think of the fire department in Philadelphia. And Lord, you are the author of our lives. So we ask for guidance as we write, as we be, as we do the actions that you have caused us to um, acknowledge and to be about, Lord. The love, the care, and the peace that we give to everyone around us, Lord. So thank you, Lord. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we continue on in our series of equality. We're talking about equality on a lot of different levels that, for those that haven't been here. Racially, gender, classism, politically. Some really tough issues. Uh, the past two weeks we talked about really sensitive issues on racism and, and gun violence in our nation and, and, and currently at our peak. Um, does anybody have anything that they might have gathered in the past two weeks from these two messages? Anything that hit home for them? It's okay if not. <laughs> no worries. Today's Juneteenth, and I want to say happy Juneteenth to all of you, as last year it was an official federal holiday. Juneteenth marks a day when federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865 to take control of the state and ensure that all enslaved people be free. The troops' arrival came just a full two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. So there are many people for two and a half years that didn't know that they were free. Juneteenth honors the end of slavery in the U.S. and is considered the longest-running African-American holiday. And we wanted to honor that these past two weeks, as we've been talking a lot about that. And today, we want to honor the dads today for Father's Day. And together this month, we're going to come to learn that. Let's say this together. We are all different as humans, but equal in God's eyes when Jesus brings us home. So happy Father's Day. I believe we have, Jocelyn has a gift for all of our fathers at the end of the service today, so make sure you, uh, you see her. We'll, we'll figure out how to get that probably at the end right there. She'll be at the door. There you go. She's going to tackle you. And for those that are on Zoom, we're going to somehow get it to you for the fathers out there, okay? All right. Today's scripture is in honor of the special dads or the father figures in our lives. Uh, thank you to all of the loving, the caring, and the hardworking ones that continue to love us each and every day. I, I saw this amazing video just a few months ago, as I'm sure some of you did as well. Take a look at the D.C.-based meteorologist Doug Kammerer and what he does when he hears that a tornado warning is in effect in his neighborhood. 
very, very closely. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm tracking this uh, so closely now. Uh, this is going to go. This is going to go right over, uh, right over my house. So very close to my house, uh, which again is in the Chevy Chase area, Bethesda area. Uh, this is along Wisconsin Avenue as well. So heads up if you live along Massachusetts or Wisconsin Avenue. Can't you in there, buddy? Yeah. All right, hey man, I want you to uh, get down in the in the basement. We got a tornado warning. All right, so I want to make sure you and you and Callie get downstairs as soon as you can. Okay. Yeah, get down there right now. Get in, the, uh, get in that bat in that ba the uh, bedroom down there, and just kind of wait for like 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Do it now. All right, thanks, buddy. All right, so that was uh, just, you know, got to warn my kids because I know where my kids are doing right now. They're probably online gaming, and they're not seeing this. So we have a tornado warning. Hopefully they saw it on their phones. Many of us got it on our phones. In the newsroom, I heard the phones go. You, should have, you could hear the kid like, right now? <laughs> it's like, yes, right now. Go downstairs. <laughs> that dad showed what kind of attitude to share with his own kids, one of kindness and one of courage. An attitude I'm sure he hopes his own kids will take to heart and learn from in the long run. So today's scripture is for the amazing dads in our lives, including the bald ones. Yes, we know some bald ones. Many of us like to make fun of them. I literally was talking about this passage today with Gary last week at our luncheon. And he was like, oh, you know, I have a bald head. People make fun of me. I'm like, oh, if you ever do that, just quote this scripture that we're going to talk about today. And I want to give a bit of a trigger warning to some of the scripture. It may seem comical, but uh, there's, some, there's some death in this of children. So I want you to, um, you know, be aware of that. Um, so our scripture is 2 Kings chapter 2, 19 to 24. That says, the people of the city said to Elisha, look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, this is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. From there, Elijah went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and I'm not joking. This is, the, this is what the scripture says. Look, called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. Oh, and the, the service was like, just like that. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Imagine me ending that like that. Wow. Wow. So I, I know that's a really hard passage to take. Some of you are probably, what did he just say? Did he just talk about bears mauling some kids? That's in the Bible? Well, there's some other plenty more crazy verses but I won't get there. I won't, I won't get into that today. My old youth minister professor, um, youth ministry professor, Duffy Robbins, he would often quote this passage to those who may be experiencing less than optimal hair lengths in their life, just like him. Yes, that's Duffy Robbins. <laughs> Today's message, it, well, it came as a challenge for me at first. It, it, to take some of the most obscure, the weird, the, 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 the most obscure verses out there and get something spiritual from them. But it actually came together once I started looking at the background, the context of this text, and what was happening before all was said about the water, and before all that was said about the bear attacks. So bear with me. You see, the city of Jericho had been, hey, it's Father's Day. I get to make father's jokes, uh, dad jokes, right? So the, the city of Jericho it had been leveled by the power of God beforehand. When Joshua, the children of Israel, they first entered into the promised land, even though those walls were leveled, much of the city still stood um, a little bit after the battle was over. Israel had burned a lot of it and had, much, and had left much of it in ruin, but there was enough left for the Israels to begin to rebuild. Okay? And when the promised land was divided among all the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin 
was assigned the land where Jericho now lay in ruins. The Benjamites began to rebuild the city and to inhabit it, but there was a problem. God had told Joshua to destroy every inhabitant and all the worldly spoils of Jericho. He was only to save the gold, the silver, and the brass for use in the temple treasury. But like every other battle, God's direction, directions were not carried out to the full letter. We were just talking about this in our, in our um, young adult Bible study. We were talking about Joshua, this very verse. So God gave them the victory there. They killed most of the people of the city, but not all of them. And they kept the vessels as God directed, but they left this seed of rebellion in the city. It would be the seed that continually grows and causes grief in the Benjamites. Now, one of the greatest tragedies of any war is that there's always non-combat casualties. It's sad to see, right? Children, women, the elderly, people that are not in the military in any way, dying. I suppose that even today in the wars that we see overseas, the biggest problem that the soldiers face is not the actual enemy. Any small group that attacks an American force right now is is easily defeated by our overwhelming firepower and technology. It's been said that we will drop a laser-guided smart bomb right on the head of whoever we want to kill. And in return, the enemy just kind of throws handmade or homemade Molotov cocktail bombs in hopes. There isn't much chance that the enemy can win, but they still put up a fight. I can remember hearing of the Vietnam War in our history class. And I'm sure our, our war veterans today could talk about this. It is supposedly the only war that the U.S. had ever lost. And do you know why we lost? It wasn't because of our inability to defeat the enemy. It wasn't because the soldiers weren't willing and able to win. It was because of the politics of war. Just as it was in Iraq. And now we're probably seeing a lot of it happen in Ukraine and Russia. It was in Vietnam as well. The problem is, how do you tell which of the people standing before you are an enemy or an innocent civilian caught in the wrong place at the wrong time? Sadly, there's no way to know. I don't condone the killing of innocent civilians, but then again, who would, right? But I do understand how the death of many civilians, it's an inescapable result of any war. But there's so many times of trusting so-called friendlies among the civilian population and then being betrayed and losing your own soldiers to their treachery, anyone would become overly cautious against trusting civilian population. Anyone from a grandmother with an AK-47 from under a bed to an ambush, uh, to, with, to, to a small child to, to, who barely is old enough to walk, who'd walk among soldiers and then die because they have a bomb strapped to them. That could be your enemy, these soldiers are thinking. Now, of course, none of us approve of such actions. I think this is what was happening in Israel and Jericho at the time and with every other people that Israel had to conquer. God gave instructions to kill every living thing, not to leave even the young alive. It sounds harsh to us now because that's not our culture today, and it did, but, and I think it did as well for the Israelites. They felt very surprised by all of this. So it isn't a surprise that Israel maybe allowed some of the civilians to live. The elderly, the women, the children. All the cities that they had conquered. It, it just sounds inhumane to just slaughter them all. Allowing them to surrender to live and then kind of indoctrinate them and, and convert them into their way of life and their way of worship seemed like the right thing to do. And that's what they were thinking. The problem with this is that when you allow some of the enemy to live, you also create for yourself a lot of problems with overcoming their old way of life. Never completely destroy their desire to be free from their captors. You know, the few that were allowed to live in Jericho became this festering sore in the land of the Benjamites. 
those who were left resented and hated Israel because of the death of their mother, their father, their, their daughters, their, their brothers, their sisters, their sons, their aunts, their uncles, and other family members. They refused to become these naturalized Israelites and to surrender their old way of life completely. These same innocent civilians became the insurgents if you will, against their captors. And it's likely that they were in a constant state of rebellion. These rebellious captives, they grew up, they had children of their own, they taught their kids never, never give up, never try, you know, throwing off, uh, the, always trying to throwing off the rule of the Benjamites. And along with their own children, some of the rebellious citizens might have got the former people of Jericho. They were very likely, they were, they were very likely able to convince some of the Benjamites to join them in their fight for the freedom. In Jericho, I have no doubt that the rebellious attitude of those who were conquered was increasing in every passing generation. The hatred of the conquered people only grew with each passing day against the Israel's government, against the Israel's religious leaders, and against Israel's God. But the Lord was gracious to Jericho and to the Benjamites even in their disobedience and their rebelliousness. Let us never be deceived into believing that people are right with God just because they seem to be doing well. Right? God sends his blessing upon all people. He sends rain upon everyone, both sinners and righteous. God loves all people, not just his own, but God hates sin. There's no place for sin in God's people. Sin has to be completely destroyed. Not one vestige of our old life is to remain. If we allow even a little bit of the old to stay in our heart, that little bit of sin will fester and will become a cancer that will destroy your soul. It's going to steal your victory. It's going to bring you before God for that final judgment in the last day to be cast into the darkness. God's love mercy and blessings upon the rebellious people of Jericho and the Benjamites, they're very evident. So Elisha, now we get to our passage. Elisha, God's man for the hour, anointed with that double portion of Elijah's calling when the mantle of Elijah fell upon him and his mentor was taken away into a chariot, chariots of fire, chariots to heaven. He was coming through Jericho on his way to Bethel. God performed a miracle for Jericho by healing that bad water. Hey, another win for God, right? Making that land fertile for them to grow the crops for the food, as we just read. If only they had accepted the worship of the Israel, the God, of the God of Israel, as easily as they accepted his blessings for that water. God's grace could still have made Jericho and the land of the Benjamites a blessed place to live. If only they had allowed God's love and his spirit to possess their hearts and change their lives, God's mercy would have been poured out on them. But it was not meant to be. If only they, could have they would have trained their children to love the God of Israel instead of hating him. Things could have been so different. I was just talking about this earlier today, that we have to treat the Bible just like the history books that we see in class. History books show a lot of anger and hatred and wars and just overall negative stuff, right? Juneteenth being a, a, a class example of that. We learn from our history books. We learn what not to do for the future. And that's what the Bible is a lot like for us. We see what's happening in 2 Kings about what not to do. So, their wickedness, their attitude of rebellion against Israel, against the God of Israel, and against that prophet of the God of Israel was going to come back and it's going to haunt them with a vengeance. We cannot mock God. We cannot sin against God. And we cannot continue to come against the chosen people of God for long without God's justice falling upon us. So as Elijah left Jericho, the children probably teenagers, maybe a little bit younger, roaming the highways like, like the street gang, certain that they were up to some mischief, up to some no good. 
And when they saw Elijah, they began to ridicule him. They began to persecute him. Hey, Baldy, head's really shiny like the sun, Baldy. Why don't you go up like Elijah, Baldy? Why don't you just leave us alone, Baldy? Get out of our city. Our city, Baldy. So can you see the sins of the fathers being visited upon these youth? Can you see the results of allowing sin to remain in the camp against God's will? It wasn't just Elisha that they were ridiculing now. They were ridiculing the God of Israel who had called Elisha. It seemed that it didn't matter to them even after the waters had been healed for them. Elijah looked back at these youths who were ridiculing them and blaspheming the God of Israel. He, he cursed them by God's command, and then God sent these two female bears into their midst. It seemed like the war wasn't over, was it? Who knows? Perhaps these youths had taken the bear cubs of, the, of these mother bears because a fury just came upon them. Forty-two children dead where they could escape. That night, there were a lot of families in Jericho who mourned for the loss of their children. Mothers and dads who taught their children to hate Israel, to hate the God of Israel, to love the idols of Jericho, and to fight against anything that Israel stood for. Now began to cry and weep for those same children. They learned the hard way that we will reap what we sow. Okay, so hatred, rebellious, rebellion, and blasphemy into the hearts and the minds of their own children, and now those same children had faced God's judgment. What does Proverbs 22 6 tell us? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We often use this scripture as a basis of hope for the repentance and the salvation of a wayward child, right? When the, when the kid gets, when I, when I got in trouble as a kid, my dad, who's a pastor, would be like, Proverbs 22, 6, straight up a child. I'm like, okay, dad, okay. And we often use it for that, but we know that we, we did our best in our teaching them the word of God, and we did all we knew to do to bring them to Jesus, but we often fail to realize that this scripture carries a double meaning. If we train up our child to walk in the paths of sin, to hate the church, to ridicule those who live for the Lord, to stay away from the house of, the, of God, to ignore the word of God, and to only focus on the good things and the worldly pleasures and the riches of this world, we will also reap what we have sown here too. Those children will grow up to believe that the way we have taught them in the right way, and they too will not depart from it. Which brings me to a commercial I saw a few years ago. It was from Gillette. It was broadcast and it was entitled, well, my message was today actually, the best a man can get. Now, for those who don't remember that commercial, let's take a look at it right now. Bullying. The Me Too movement against sexual toxic harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. Sexual harassment is taking over. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? <laughs> what I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something boys. finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Once, but she says it's the wrong thing. And there will be no going back. Because we. We believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right oh, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big. Yo, men, And small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. 
because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. That video gets me goosebumps every time. We see this video of how we as dads and as parents teach our children to behave. In this case, it's about how boys have been growing up generation after generation, like these boys we talked about in the passage, maybe to not respect women in our, day, in our case. There may be some of you who might disagree with the video or think that we are making our kids more and more submissive to women and how soft we've become. Well, I think I would disagree with you there because I see a lot of great things coming from this video. I see defending women who are being objectified. I see chivalry happening. I see a stopping of violence. I see fatherhood that encourages independent children. I see disciplining bad behavior in young boys, and I see standing up for those being bullied. The truth of the matter is toxic masculinity. It's a real thing. We live in a fallen world where sin runs rampant. Morality is sometimes in short supply. Men have occupied the most powerful positions in the world for centuries, and we have a responsibility to own our imperfections and our own shortcomings. We all get it wrong sometimes. God sent his son, Jesus, to earth, not only to save humanity from eternal separation from him, but also to show men and women what true biblical masculinity and femininity look like. This is something we can impart into our next generation right now. With each passing generation, the sins of the father are visited upon their children, but the sins of each passing generation only become stronger, more evil, and more destructive, and then the sins of the fathers are passed on again and again and again. It's no surprise that this world is growing more evil each and every day. Humankind is bringing about its own judgment for sin. And the only thing that can stop this cycle of sin from generation to generation is for someone to find the Lord and their Savior and to be born again. And that's the key to turning your own family around. But the answer is not just in accepting Christ for yourself. You have to train the next generation to follow the Lord or nothing will change for them. That's where your faithfulness to God, your commitment to his word, his work, and his church are so very important. What's the best way to train a child? By your correct example. They will see what you do more than they will hear uh, what you say. Who's training your children, your, your stepkids or your, your own grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, your cousins? Are you training them or are you allowing the world to train them by default? Are you training them by your example or are you allowing their friends in the world to do the work for you? Are you really teaching them to go in the right way? Or are you just hoping that someone or somehow it will all just turn out all right? The righteousness of the fathers can sometimes be passed along to their children if those children accept God's ways. But the sins of the fathers are always passed along to their children because the nature of that child is to follow the paths of sin to begin with. So what are our children learning from us? Are we passing our sins to our children? Or are we passing our faith? One day we're all going to face that judgment of God. And I pray that we are found faithful in teaching our children about Jesus so that they will enter heaven's gates. Will the next generation in your family benefit from the example that you have given? Let's pray about that. Heavenly Father, make me a better parent not just to my own children, but the, to the children that are part of my faith community here. Teach me to understand my children. 
to listen patiently to what they have to say and to answer all their questions kindly. Keep me from interrupting them, Lord, wagging my finger at them, contradicting them. Make me as courteous to them as I would have them be to me. Forbid that I should ever laugh at their mistakes or resort to shame or ridicule if they displease me. Bless me with the bigness to grant them all their reasonable requests and the courage to deny them privileges that I know will do them harm. Make me fair, just, and kind. And fit me, O Lord, to be loved, respected, and imitated by these children. For it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Let us continue to worship and stand and sing in a thousand reasons.
find the wisdom and the power and the righteousness through God who blesses us each and every day. I commend the parents and the fathers here that continue to be upstanding citizens and an upstanding citizen for God. The kids are watching. Our kids here at church, they're watching. And I know that your faithfulness, your smiles, will be encouraging to them all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you've given us and bless us and each of the fathers that have impacted our lives. And if they are now with you, Lord, we thank you for them. We celebrate their lives. We celebrate the meaning that they have given us and the purpose that they give us each and every day. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. And don't forget, Father's, we got a gift for you right outside for Josh. Great. In that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near in my time.